Hey everybody, it's Pastor Tori. Thank you so much for joining us for another week of our Freedom Study. Uh, we've been having so much fun going through this, uh, whether you're joining us through an online group or you're attending one of our in-person groups or maybe you're just checking out the Freedom Resources page to see what freedom is all about. Let me say thanks for stopping in. I hope in the future you'll be able to join us for one of our groups. In this session, we're going to be in week seven talking about the issue of forgiveness. Now, this is a heavy issue for a lot of people. In fact, this uh, is probably the most common uh, hurt, habit, and hang-up that we have uh, when it comes to moving forward into a life of freedom. Uh, forgiveness is a, is a tricky thing because it's, it's a wound that takes place in a moment, but it's the lasting effects of the wound that really begin to uh, hurt us and, and create some real lasting damage on the inside. And so we're going to talk about forgiveness, what it is, how we can move past it, uh, what do we do when we can't forgive somebody, we can't bring ourselves to that place of forgiveness. Uh, so we're going to talk about all of that. But let me just stop before we go any further in the video. And what I want to say is that if you have not had the chance to read this session yet, let me encourage you, go and read this session in your Freedom Study. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a real introspective session. It's going to require you to ask a lot of questions of yourself. Uh, there's a lot of scripture in this session that we believe is, um, is essential to moving forward in a life of forgiveness. So let me encourage you to go do that. If you don't have a physical copy of the book, we've actually made a digital copy of the book available on the Freedom Resources page. So just click that back arrow at the top of the screen and scroll up to the top of that Freedom Resources page and, and go check out this session. Uh, because I think it's going to be not just worth your time, but it's going to uh, have a real impact on your heart and on your mind as, as we approach this subject. Now as we move forward, let's uh, go ahead and let's talk about our theme verse for this video. This is Ephesians 1.7. And He, He being God, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. So we see that uh, in this verse, what Paul is writing is he's saying that it was from God's kindness and from God's grace that He offers the blood of His Son to give us freedom and forgiveness. Uh, and that's so important to understand. It's that there's not anything that we've ever done to earn God's forgiveness. In fact, it was from a place of His kindness and His grace that He sent His Son to do something that we couldn't do on our own. Uh, so the starting point of forgiveness is knowing that this is an action that uh, you as the forgiver has to do. You can't wait for the person that you need to forgive to do anything if you're ever going to experience forgiveness. This is an action that you have the responsibility for. Now this is not easy for a lot of people. In fact, we, there's plenty of reasons that we find ourselves trapped in this place of unforgiveness. So we're going to break down what those are. Uh, and these are just three struggles that the book lists, uh, that we, uh, or three reasons that we struggle to forgive. And the first is we have a wrong idea of what forgiveness is. Um, and so because of that, uh, we, we tend to think it's something else and in our uh, misconception of what forgiveness is we feel like it's something that we could never do. Number two is we don't think it's fair. Um, in fact we, we feel like we can't forgive somebody until things have been made right. But you know forgiveness is not about getting equal. Uh, getting equal is vengeance and uh, the Bible is very clear that vengeance belongs to the Lord. So we have to understand that if we're going to move forward in forgiveness, forgiveness is not uh, equated to fairness. And number three, we don't think that we can do it. And this is honestly the toughest place to be out of all of these, is it's because we're in this place where something has been done to us, someone has said something to us, someone has walked out on us, and we've carried the wound of their actions for so long, and, and, we're, and we find ourselves in such a place of hurt and uh, desperation and sadness and grief and loss that we just don't feel like we have the strength to do what God is calling us to do. And maybe that's you. And if that is you, I just want to say that as we go through this uh, session, my prayer for you is that you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and His power, and you're going to realize that this is something that you actually can do and you're called to do. And when you do it, you're going to step into a new season of your life uh, that's never going to be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at this first reason. This is, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not minimizing the offense, right? So a lot of times when someone says something to us that hurts us or they do something that hurts us, we just say, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Well, the reality is sometimes it is a big deal. What they did was really wrong. It, it hurt. It created a real 
impact, maybe not just in our life, but in other people's lives. So forgiveness is not minimizing the offense or negating the, uh, the real effects of what has taken place. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened. Uh, there's the old cliche, forgive and forget. Well, sometimes you can't forget. Sometimes you're so scarred and so affected by what's taken place that forgetting it is just not an option. Uh, the only option that we have at this point is just learning to live with it and move beyond it. And number three is reconciliation. I think sometimes we feel that in order for us to have true forgiveness that we've got to get right with that other person. We've got to work things out to where, um, you know, we feel like we can restore that relationship. But the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation is forgiveness is one way. Forgiveness is about you and nobody else. Reconciliation is a, is a two-way street. It requires you to do your part and they to do their part. And unfortunately, and this is something that you just have to learn going through the freedom study, but once you learn it, it really changes your perspective on so much, is you are only responsible for you. You can't control the actions of anybody else. You can't forgive them and hope that they'll come around. That's up to them. And so reconciliation might be an option, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that re real quick right here, is um, if, if, if you see the following three things in the other person, reconciliation might be on the table. Uh, but if these three things aren't there, then uh, part of forgiveness might be understanding that reconciliation, um, it, it may not happen or it may happen at a, at a far later date, but it's, it's just not an option right now. So let's look at these three things. The first is repentance. In order for there to be true reconciliation, the person who has done the offense needs to really understand that what they did is wrong and there's got to be a repentance. And repentance isn't guilt. Repentance is a change in direction, right? And so just because somebody feels bad about what they did, um, that's not necessarily repentance. Repentance is choosing to take the actions necessary to make sure that what took place doesn't happen again. Number two is restitution. And in this, uh, if, if they're willing to do what it takes to make things right, if they're willing to uh, take the necessary steps to uh, maybe undo the effects of what they've done or, or compensate in the areas that, um, that they, they, they harmed. And number three is rebuilding trust. And so this has got to be uh, an essential component. Relationships, all relationships are built on trust. So if we are going to experience reconciliation, this person needs to understand that there's been a setback in the trust and, and they're going to have to go through a rebuilding phase and that's okay. And if they're not willing to go through that rebuilding phase, then they might not be ready for reconciliation. So let me just ask you to think and pray about uh, the people in your life who may have uh, done harm to you or maybe people uh, in your life that you have offended or that you have hurt and, uh, and, and, they, and they need to forgive you. Let me just encourage you to take a look at these three things and pray through them. Maybe you need to work on these three things. But let me just say, if there's somebody in your life that you really would like to see a relationship reconciled with, make sure these three things are there before you jump in because you really can step into a season of, uh, of greater hurt and greater pain, and, uh, and we don't want that for you. Let's talk about the second thing. Forgiveness isn't fair. This is a verse from Matthew 18, 21 through 22. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus looks back at Peter and says, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. That's over 490 times. Now, this isn't, Jesus isn't giving this number out as this is the magic number of forgiveness, but what he's saying is, is forgiveness isn't something that we have a limit on. We have, if we're going to live free, We've got to learn to live from a place of forgiveness where it's something that we're constantly offering and letting it flow out of us. Let's take a look at this last point, or last reason we struggle to forgive, and that is the feeling that we can't forgive. And this is a verse from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. This is the Apostle Paul talking, and what I love about this passage is he's saying that the, the, the miracle of the Christian life is that every day we're called to do things that in our own strength and in our own power we don't have the ability to do. But if we'll lean on Christ's strength, if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and to come work in us, then we're going to be able to do things that we could never do in our own power. 
And, uh, and that's really when we put the love and the, and, the, and the reality of Christ's work in our life on display. You know, in the old days, people were walking around and they were looking at Jesus in, the per in person and they could see what he was saying or hear what he was saying and see what he was doing. But now Jesus is on display through us and the way that we live our lives. And this is one of the ways that we do that is we've got to get to a place where we can live free of offense, live from a place of forgiveness. And as we do that, the people in our lives will see that love, that love, that forgiveness, that supernatural grace working in us. Um, and it's going to reveal to them what Christ can do in their life as well. Now, here's something we've got to remember about forgiveness. And this is, and this is kind of the tough moment where we've got to just be real about the issue is the forgive and forgive. As forgiven people, as believers who have had our own debt, a debt that we could never pay back in our own power, we have to realize we have an obligation to show that same grace to other people, the same grace that God showed us. Here's a verse from Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. It says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. In this verse, what we see is that we've got to lay that old stuff aside. We've got to lay aside the things that we may want to do, right? When someone's wronged us, we may want to retaliate. But what we're seeing here is God's saying, no, don't do any of that. Instead, forgive people as God has forgiven you. We have to participate in that forgiveness cycle if we're going to advance God's work here on earth and discover the freedom that he's called us to live into. Here's the problem with unforgiveness. It's a trap, right? It's like being shot with a poison arrow. You can pull the arrow out and the wound from the arrow will heal, but if there's poison on the tip, that poison's gonna spread throughout your body and it's gonna create problems in areas that are totally unrelated to where that wound was initially. That's what, how unforgiveness is in our life. When we allow a, someone to come and say something or do something, it hurts us. But the real lasting damage isn't from the wound, it's from what we allowed the wound to do, or what we allowed the poison to do when it stayed on the inside of us and worked its way through our body. You know, offense is the bait that the enemy uses to lure us into bondage. What someone does to you, an offense, that's not bondage, that's an action. But unforgiveness is a place of bondage. That's where you find yourself ensnared. And the Greek word for offense is scandalone, which means the bait. And I love this because it's so interesting and provides such clarity about the topic is that when people do things that offend us, we have to look at it through our spiritual lens. And we have to see that what they did, you know, yeah, that was mean, that was unkind, they shouldn't have done it. But we have to be able to see what the enemy is doing through that offense. And that is he's using it as bait to lure us to this place where he can trap us and ensnare us. And God is saying that if you'll see things through my lens, if you'll look through a heavenly perspective, then you'll be able to see that when people do things that harm you or wrong you, you don't have to fall for the trap anymore. You can choose to live from a place of forgiveness and live free of bondage. And that is something that we should all aspire to. And so when we look at the unforgiveness trap, we see that Satan uses offense as bait to lure us into a deep trap of unforgiveness. And that the lasting damage is not the offense, but it's the enduring effects after the offense. And so we don't want those enduring effects in our life. We don't want it in your life. And so if we're going to do that, we've got to be able to see an offense for what it is. It's bait and we don't have to fall for it. These are some of the traps that the enemy sets. And maybe you can relate to some of these. Maybe you have unforgiveness in your life about one of these things. Uh, but these are just five that the book lists, but I think these really capture uh, in broad strokes uh, kind of the, 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 what we really struggle to forgive. Uh, and these are some of them. Number one is when we're betrayed. Um, a betrayal of trust is, is maybe the deepest wound that we can feel. Uh, relationships are built on trust, and so when that trust is betrayed, um, the relationship is betrayed, and, and that's a deep wound. Sometimes we internalize it. We think maybe, was it something we did? Was it something we said? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe just in their uh, own malaction, they, um, they did something that really harmed us. Number two is when we're falsely accused. There's nothing that hurts our pride or our ego as being falsely accused of something. 
whether or not we can make a defense for ourselves, there's something about it that just, it's a character attack, and, and that wound hurts, and we can hold on to unforgiveness for people who uh, falsely accuse us. Number three is when we're rejected. Uh, many of us have, have been rejected. Maybe you were rejected by your father uh, who walked out on your family when you were young. Maybe you felt like you were rejected by your mother. In high school, you were rejected by friends. Maybe uh, you had a spouse who, who walked away from you. And those rejection wounds are deep and they hurt. And for some of us, moving past those seems impossible. Uh, but it's those actions that take place, those actions of rejection that the enemy wants to use and prey on to do something in you that's going to last far longer than the actions that take place. Number four is when we're abused. This could be physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse. Uh, any abuse that takes place oftentimes will uh, realize that what happened really shouldn't have happened and will take our anger and frustration and will hold on to it rather than releasing it and will focus it back on that person and if it's as if it's going to harm them and, and give them the same hurt that it gave us and the reality is, and I just need to be very honest with you, it's not going to do that. When you hold on to unforgiveness, you're not hurting that person. You're only hurting you. And so God wants to set you free from that hurt so you can experience uh, just the joy and purpose in life that He's called you to live in, a life of freedom. Number five, when we're humiliated or embarrassed, uh, this could be something that somebody says publicly. It could be an action that takes place. It could be uh, where you're uninformed about something and people show up and, and you feel like the odd person out and you're embarrassed. And a, a place of humiliation is often one of the places where we hold on to resentment. Um, but what I want you to see about all of these, and this is so important, that there's not a thing on this list that Jesus himself hasn't experienced. And there's a reason that he experienced it. And he experienced it so that when he intercedes for us, when he comforts us, he can relate to everything that we're going through. There's not a pain that we feel that he can't say, I've been there. I know that. He was betrayed by his disciples. He was falsely accused uh, by the people of Israel. He was rejected as the king that he was supposed to be. He was abused physically uh, by the Roman guards and, and was put on a cross to suffer the most horrendous death, death possible. He was humiliated. He was the king of all kings, the king of the universe. And he was stripped down and a crown of thorns was put on his head and he was forced to carry a cross to his own execution site. So there's nothing that Jesus can't relate to. And even in that moment where he was experiencing all of this thing, his prayer on the cross was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's because he was able to see through a heavenly lens. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were inflicting pain on someone they had hatred for. But what they didn't realize was that they were operating uh, from this place of sin and evil, and Jesus was offering them forgiveness even then. And so, if we're going to live unoffended, then we've got to take three steps to keep our hearts pure. The number one, uh, the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to recognize our own imperfection. We've got to realize that, um, you know, we mess up ourselves, that we're not perfect. And that doesn't mean that your imperfection and that your own faults uh, made whatever happened to you or whatever was said to you that you deserved it. That's not to say that at all. But what we have to realize is in our day to day, uh, we go through our life and we're going to offend people. We're going to say things that hurt people. We're going to do things that make people unhappy. And we've got to realize that uh, in order for us to live in freedom, we've got to live also from a place of um, asking forgiveness of other people. We've got to uh, be willing to forgive because offenses come. Number two, We've got to focus on the real enemy. We've got to realize that when somebody does something to us that they shouldn't have, uh, or they say something that they shouldn't have, we've got to realize what's really going on. There's something spiritual about it. And we've got to, the, the Bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with principalities and spiritual beings of the dark. And so we have to realize that there is a spiritual world that we cannot see. And in that spiritual world, there is a real enemy who's, who's uh, crawling around like a roaring lion is what the Bible says and uh, he's seeking whom he can devour and he would love to devour you using the offense that somebody else does. Number three, we've got to receive the love of God. 
When we have the confidence of the love of God on our side, when we know what God has said about us, when we know what God has done for us, when we know what's waiting for us in eternity, there is nothing that we can't experience in this life and triumph over because we are operating from a place of love and security. And so I want to take a look at this verse from 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 1, 25 through 28. This is forgiveness in action. This is a little bit longer piece of Scripture, but I just want to read it over you because I believe that there's something in it um, that really is going to um, uh, speak to the situation. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you wore when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Sometimes forgiveness to us can seem like a, like a weak act. Like if we forgive, we're not being strong. We're not triumphing over this. But the reality is, as Jesus is saying, that what we need to do is we've got to trust God and His kingdom uh, and do it His way because when we do, we take the things like, that seem like a thing of weakness, like forgiveness, and what we do is we triumph over darkness in that. And so God wants to use things that may not make sense to us, like things like prayer, things like blessing, things like um, forgiveness, uh, things like choosing peace instead of violence. Uh, but when we do those things, here's, here's the scriptural promise. When we choose God's way, we can't lose. Because God's way is, is wiser than our way. His way is stronger than our ways. His way is best. So forgiveness is something that we've got to put in action. But when we do it, we're actually operating from a place of strength. Now let's make it practical. Let's talk about the daily steps for walking out forgiveness. The first, and this is hard, we've got to learn to pray for the people who offended you. It doesn't mean they deserve your prayers. They haven't earned your prayers. But it's not about that. Remember, it's not about getting fair. Forgiveness is about you getting free. And prayer for we got to pray for those who have offended us. And what I think you'll realize is when you pray for someone, um, the Bible says that when we pray, we pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit intercedes for us in groanings that we don't even understand. So when we do that, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to come in us and work on us. And we'll begin to see that person the way that God sees them. Number two, we've got to bless people who have offended us. Many times the only thing we want to do is curse people who have offended us, but what God is saying is that we've got to bless people who offend us because when we bless them, we're going to speak life over them and we're going to participate in the kingdom work and that's going to allow us to live free. And lastly, we have to do good to people who have offended us. And this can sometimes be the hardest thing. Sometimes we feel like if we're going to do good to somebody, we're doing it with grit, like gritted teeth and, and clenched fist, but as you begin to do good to people who have offended you, you're going to do two things. You're going to find freedom in the process, and that person is going to experience the love and forgiveness of God through you. And that is important. This is how you participate in God's kingdom work here on earth, just by allowing Him to work in your life. Now let's talk about an issue that may be a separate topic. It may not be something that somebody's done to you or said to you or uh, maybe uh, done about you in front of people. Uh, maybe the person that you struggle to forgive most is you. You've done something in your past. You said something to somebody. You walked away from your family. You said something to your, uh, your, your friend or colleague, and, and you ruined a relationship in doing that. And you don't know how to move forward because you can't help but feel the weight of what you did. I want to I want to let you know that this forgiveness session this is for you too and God wants to set you free from any unforgiveness that you have within yourself. Getting past our past is sometimes the biggest obstacle that we face. And there are some steps that we can take to confront the past. Um, but let's start instead of talking about what we can do, let's talk about what we shouldn't do. These are the mistakes that we make. And I think if you're making these mistakes, these might be the reason that you haven't experienced the forgiveness for yourself that God wants you to have. Number one is we try to bury it. We don't want to acknowledge it. Rather than coming to grips with what really took place, we suppress that memory. Uh, and we, suppression can happen through a lot of different ways. We can choose to distract ourselves, sometimes busy people. Uh, the reason you're busy is because you don't want to take the time to think about what's going on in your life. 
It could be um, alcohol or drugs. Oftentimes we try to mask and, and nullify the things that are going on in our life by pretending that they don't exist, so we try to bury it. But the reality is we can't bury it, and the hard part is addressing it, but we've got to do hard things if we're going to experience freedom. The second thing is we beat ourselves up, and we, we, we feel like we're responsible for giving ourselves the punishment that we deserve. We know that we did wrong, and nobody's punishing us, so we're going to make sure that we punish ourselves. And, and God says, I don't want you to do that at all. In fact, it's God's desire that we experience the forgiveness that He has for us. Because whenever we wrong somebody else, the real wrong that we did is we wronged God. And God has already given us the forgiveness that we need for what we've done. And we just need to accept that forgiveness. Number three is we blame others. Um, instead of coming to grips, this is one of the ways that we try to distract ourselves from dealing with it, is we try to make excuses about why we did what we did or, or why we said what we said, and, and we try to make it okay. But the reality is we can't do that. We've got to come to grips with what we did, take ownership and responsibility for it, and then go to God with it and let Him give us the forgiveness that we need. Um, and these are some of the things that we've got to do to get past the past. Number one is we've got to stop trying to earn forgiveness. You can earn forgiveness. The forgiveness that you need and need to receive from God, it's already there. You can't do anything more to earn it. You can't do anything more to lose it. The forgiveness is there. If you have a relationship with God, you have been set free, and that freedom is available to you, and you are called to live in it. Number two, we receive God's forgiveness by faith. And remember, faith is something we walk by faith, not by sight. So even when we don't feel it, even though we don't feel like it's right, even though we can't see how it works, we have to understand that that forgiveness is there, and in faith, we've got to claim it over ourselves. And maybe you need to do this every day. Maybe you need to do it hourly. You just have to accept the forgiveness uh, that God has given you in Jesus' name. And number three, we've got to defeat every lie with truth. In this, uh, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about how whenever we go into our life to get out of our heart the things that don't need to be there, it's important that we put something back in its place. Otherwise, we just leave a, a vacancy that can be filled by anything. What we have to realize is as we defeat the lies of the enemy, as we move to a place of forgiveness, as we move to a place of choosing not to live uh, in the wounds that people have done to us, what we realize is that we've got to put God's truth in that place. And as we fill it up with God's truth, we're going to have something to stand on, something to lean on when we find ourselves in a place of being offended because we'll know uh, really what's taking place and we'll know that we don't have to hold on to those offenses anymore. We can truly live a life of freedom. So as you meet with your group this week, let me just encourage you to be honest, be transparent, open up about the things that are going on on the inside um, things that you're holding on to, things in your life that you feel like you need forgiveness for. Because I believe that when you shine a light on the dark places in your life, you're going to make room for the Holy Spirit to come in there, do a work in you, and to set you uh, in, and release you into a life of freedom that you've never known or experienced thus far. And so I'm praying for you this week. I know it's going to be good. I know it's going to be hard, but we're going to do this together, and we're going to step forward in freedom together. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us, and God bless. Have a great week.